All right. Again, I'll remind you that the, when, one week from today is the second midterm in class, 30 questions, multiple choice, usual thing. My, my best suggestion for, for preparing is take the old exams. Any questions about exam stuff? Yeah. Am I, am I going to start with batteries? It probably will start somewhere in flashlights, because I guess that's where we sort of finished for, for the last exam. Um, and, this will, and it will go through radio, which I'll finish, and maybe into microwave ovens. Um, yeah, there is one more uh, problem set five was just due, really. And problem set six I'll put up later this afternoon. I'm finally ready to get it up there. All right. And it will be due on Wednesday. All right. Back to radio, which is where, where I, I left off really on Wednesday. And then I spent, on Monday and Wednesday, I spent uh, looking back at things that I'd left behind. The idea of a radio wave. And you will see radio waves are the same concept as microwaves the same concept as light. Uh, in fact, they're, they're, they go all the way into x-rays and gamma rays. They're all the same phenomena, differing only in, in, the, in, in, the, in the numbers, not in the concept. And so what a radio wave is, is a structure in space that consists of only two things, an electric field and a magnetic field. They're both necessary because each one creates the other. So they're a team. They, they, they sit there recreating each other. and in the absence of anything around them, they have to move. So they travel through empty space, which is, an, which is actually is, in, in itself is kind of a surprising thing. This is a wave that doesn't travel like on water or in air. It travels through space. It doesn't need anything there. It, it whizzes along very fast. In fact, in, the, in empty space, it travels at a special speed known as the speed of light, which it's more special than just light. It's a special speed. It, it has to do with the whole nature of how the universe works. Um, it is the fastest speed there is. And light happens to travel at it. Um, nonetheless, it, it carries the name light because, the speed of light, because um, that's where it's most obviously present, that special speed. Anyhow, part of it today is to talk about how those two fields manage to recreate each other. And how you launch one of these things, how do you get one of these waves going? Um, you know, with sound waves, you know, I can do that. I can send this ripple across through the, through the air. Uh, on, a, on the surface of water, you smack the water. You, you sort of, how do you get one of these electromagnetic ripples to, to, to travel out through space? And the other thing is, how do you receive it? And to put radio into a concept, that, uh, into a context that's more than just abstract, Radio is used to transmit information. Uh, way back, you know, in, in 50, 50 years ago, the only information that was, tra that was transmitted routinely by radio was sound. Um, actually, that's not even true. Television also. But uh, now it transmits everything. So I mean, you all potentially get lost. Lo you're lost right now playing with radio wave inter you know, information coming to and from you with radio waves. So basically, the idea is, Something else I have to convey to you is, is an understanding of, of how information is transferred by way of a radio wave. All right, so that's the, that's the plan here. Um, this, this slide, just, just pointing out the idea that the electric and magnetic fields can, can recreate each other. In order for that to happen, we have to sort of finish talking about the relationship between electric and magnetic fields. We started off, so this is the last time I think I, I'll present this slide. I got now to version three of this slide. Way back, maybe even before I, version zero would have been that the magnetic fields are produced simply by magnetic poles or subatomic particles that have magnetic poles. And electric fields are produced by charges or subatomic particles that have charge. That was the early story, the original story. The world of electricity is all by itself charges. The world of magnetism is all by itself poles. End of story. Well, that isn't the end of the story. Uh, we started seeing things like, well, you can make magnetic fields another way. You don't need a pole around to make a magnetic field. Just move charge. So moving charge is magnetic. Uh, it turned out also, moving pole is electric. 
If you move a magnet, you create an electric field. And the last, the la so, that, so, so I've, I've just talked about you know, this, this fir the first line in each of these two sort of paragraphs. Magnetic fields can be made by magnetic poles. Electric fields can be made by electric charges. But magnetic fields can also be created by moving, moving charges. And electric fields can be made by moving poles. How about the last pair of lines? It turns out that magnetic fields can also be produced by changing electric fields. And correspondingly, electric fields can be created by changing magnetic fields. So basically, anything that, that changes with time, magne any magnetic thing that changes with time produces electric fields. And any electric thing that changes with time produces magnetic fields. It's all symmetric. The only thing that's not symmetric about this whole story is that we've never, never found free magnetic poles. Uh, they always come in pairs of equal and opposite strength. So there's no net pole around. Uh, otherwise, very symmetric story. Um, any questions about this, these ideas at this point? Well, the key observation for the purposes of dealing with, uh, with an electromagnetic wave is you can make a magnetic field by having a changing electric field. And you can create an electric field by having a changing magnetic field. The, the wherewithal for this, this teamwork to exist is up there on that, on that slide. Electric, a changing electric field can create a magnetic field. A changing magnetic field can create an electric field. If you have them both changing properly, they'll create each other and recreate each other, and off they go. Um, another thing that I should make sure that I've, I've conveyed to you is the idea that electric fields and separately magnetic fields both contain energy. It takes energy to create a magnetic field. It takes energy to create an electric field. Um, a, a, a charge, like an electron, has a negative charge. It, it has energy in its, in its electric field. Uh, it can't release that energy because the only way it can release that energy is to, to, is to disappear, and that would violate the conservation of charge. But all electric fields do have energy in them. All right. So having said that, I can say you know, the, the, the idea that a, that a, that a self-perpetuating structure can exist is, follows out sort of uh, intuitively. If, if they can make each other, well, uh, that's fine. You, if you get them started, they can keep making each other, and off they go. What does the thing that they make look like? And here, I'm going to try a couple different ways of conveying it. Uh, the first, there's, there's, a, there's a static picture up there on the screen of what an electromagnetic wave looks like. Let me just flesh it out, not on the screen, but I'll, but I'll walk through it here in, in pretend land. I'll, just, I'll, I'll animate it with my hands. If you, I'm going to start off by stopping time. We're going to have an electromagnetic wave that will, when I let time go on, head off to your right. And at this moment in time, and it's a flash photograph of the whole thing, and I'm going to be able to walk around it. We're going to follow the wave, the electromagnetic wave, along a single line of its path. It's, we're only paying attention to this line right here. We're not going to go up and down, not toward you away from you. Nothing's moving up or down. Nothing's moving toward you away from you. The only thing that's going to be happening is fields will be pointing in various directions along this line. All right? Electric and magnetic fields. And at this moment in time, we look along our little, our little our line. And right along here, oh, there's an electric field here. And it's all pointing up. And, it, and over here, it's kind of weak. And now it's getting stronger, more upward, more upward, and less and less and less, and then it's weak again. So there's an electric field. The, the field is located on this line, but we can represent it, its strength and direction with arrows. The direction of the arrow is which way the field is pointing and which way an electric charge will be pushed. And the length of the arrow is how strong that push is. And it goes from no push to stronger and stronger and stronger upward, and then less and less and less. Can you visualize that here? It's the same now. If I, if I, point, it's, it, I just walked you through this, this part of of this, this picture. This is a fla again, another flash photograph along this line. And there's the electric field. It's weak at the beginning, or nothing. It gets stronger and stronger upward. But those arrows don't mean anything's going upward. It's just pointing upward. Big difference between going somewhere and pointing somewhere. All the action is still along a horizontal line. OK, that electric field goes 
weak to stronger, 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 and then weaker, weaker, and then it goes downward, stronger, 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 and then not, then up. And it, it, these are all sign, these are all trigonometric functions, the sines and cosines. Uh, not surprisingly, they show up all over the place in physics. Those functions, and so their the electric field is just up and down, and it's and it's it's got a a uh, this sinusoidal behavior to it, and we can look at a few details of it. For example, the distance between this uh, electric electric field up maximum right here, and the next one, which is right about here, that distance it's a it's it's a distance in space. It's real distance. It's measured in meters. That's about a meter and you know a third or something like that. That's known as the wavelength of the wave. Is that okay? Um, the, this electric field that I've just uh, drawn for you isn't the whole story because an electric field by itself is unstable. It can't, it can't, it can't self-sustain. It needs its teammate, the magnetic field. And for reasons having to do with the relationship between you know, when, it, when an electric field changes, it creates a magnetic field. When a magnetic field changes, it creates an electric field. There are directions associated with these things. And the directions are detailed by what the, the, a set of famous equations known as Maxwell's equations. Um, yeah, they, they end up, you end, may have seen them on somebody's t shirt. I mean, the physicists like to wear these things like, wow, I'm cool, I've got Maxwell's equations on my t shirt. It doesn't matter. It's, th there are, the relationships exist. With some mathematical training, you can figure out the relationship between the directions and stuff. The point at the moment is that the magnetic field associated with this, with this pair that are an electromagnetic wave is horizontal toward you and away from you. If that's the direction of propagation, which, is, which I've told you it is, toward the right, it turns out the electric field is at right angles to that direction, namely up and down. And the magnetic field is at right angles to the, the, both of those. It's at right angles to the direction of propagation and the direction of the electric field, namely, so that all is left. If, you, if, you've, if you've used horizontally to the right to, as the, the path, and you've used vertical as the electric field, the only thing that's left is the magnetic field. It has to be horizontal toward you and away from you. If it goes, we got this right? Yeah. If it, at this point where the magnetic field is, sorry, the electric field is pointing up, the magnetic field points toward you for, my, for the wave I've just described. And it, goes, it starts at the same point where there's no electric field. It has no magnetic field. Then it gets stronger and stronger toward you. And then just as the electric field is petering out here, the magnetic field peters out. And then the electric field goes down, and the magnetic field goes away from you. So, they're, so, they're, so they're, they're, they, they go like this. Hey, <laughs> can I do this? Too, many, too much thinking. Now I'm already burned out. Okay? You might think, well, what if the magnetic field pointed the other way? That's, that's also perpendicular. It's also at right angles to the, to the direction of travel and the direction of the electric field. If the magnetic field pointed the other way, the wave would move the other way. It would head to your left. So that's the, that's the effect of reversing that, that magnetic field relative to the electric field. Um, these guys, so these guys work as a team together. And that, so I've so far I've just described it in terms of uh, a flash photograph, just one instant of time. Now, because of the, the, the new version of the, of the book, it's new to me, not necessarily to you. Uh, vertically polarized, there it is. This. This is what, it, what it's like, and I, can I get repeat? Yes, it's on already. OK, so this, this is that wave now, if I let time go, time uh, happen. The wave, here's, the, here's that electric field up, and at the same time, the magnetic field toward you, and they're moving. The, the location of the, of the electric field up peak doesn't sit still. It heads to the right at the famous speed of light, really fast. So any feature of this, of this wave that you see is moving to the right at, at outrageous speed. The wavelength of the wave is the distance between the peaks, between, between identical peaks, you know, peak up, peak up, and what else? All this action, again, is taking place along that yellow line. Nothing's going up or down or toward you away from you. It's only pointing up or down. And if you put an electric charge here, for example, right there, it's being pushed up right now 
It's being pushed down right now. It's being pushed up right now. And if you put a compass in here, a magnetic compass, it would point north pole away from you, north pole toward you, north pole away from you, and so on. These fields are they're real. They're, they're just like we've seen all along. The only crazy thing is that there, nothing else is around. There's no charge around, and there's no magnetic pole, no permanent magnets, no, no, no magnetic anything, just the fields. Can you, is this OK? Or questions about this? Yeah, Rachel? Yeah. So the question is, if the electric field creates the magnetic field, and the magnetic field creates electric field, it, you know, it's a chicken or egg problem. Like, who created what to begin with? Well, these didn't appear by accident. They were launched. So there, there is a starting point. And at the starting point, now I'll come back. The starting point, I can give you a, a, a brief piece of it. The starting point, there's probably an electric charge. And electric charge just sitting still is boring. It creates an electric field and nothing else. OK? That's not going to make an electromagnetic wave. If I have an elect uh, electric charge that's moving at a steady pace, constant velocity, it's not only electric now, it's also magnetic. It's a current. It's a weird current. You know, it's moving charge, and moving charge is magnetic. So it, it will create, oh, you know, here, it will create a magnetic field. The magnetic field has a weird direction. It's a loop around this moving charge. But nothing's changing about that magnetic field. And so the electric field is. It's a little messy because it's, it's one charge has, you can watch it go by. It's a little, there, there's, there's some, com some complications of things are changing. But basically, it does not launch a wave. Uh, where you get a wave is when you take the charge and don't just hold it still and don't just let it move at constant velocity. Make it accelerate. And uh, the best example of acceleration is this. If I take it up and down and up and down, it is. First off, you've got an electric field that's, that's jiggling around. And it's going from electric field up here to electric field down to up to down to up. Right? Electric field always points away from a positive charge. So that's a, that's a fluctuating electric field that's sort of got a sin, sinusoidal character to it. right? Ooh, that's interesting. And at the same time, the moving charge, it's a current heading down, which makes an electric magnetic field this way. And then it's, a, then it's charge moving up, which makes a magnetic field pointing the other way and down and up. The magnetic field is also flipping back and forth, kind of sinusoidally. You've got both of them. And a piece of the, uh, not all of these, the electric field and all the magnetic field heads off across space, but part of it does. Part of it becomes this team that, that is self-perpetuating, uh, and off it goes. Is that OK? And I'll show you in a little while how an antenna works. Because an antenna uses not one charge, but a whole lot of charge. It just sloshes a whole bunch of charge up and down. And in doing that, it creates the electric field that fluctuates. And it creates the magnetic field that fluctuates. And the two of them become a team, and off they go. OK? So the chicken or egg is finally, you know, there, there is, there is a, there's a launcher. There's also a receiver. And, uh, when one of these guys goes, one of, the, one of these electromagnetic waves travels past a charge, it jiggles the charge up and down. And that charge um, acquires energy from the jiggling motion. You can, it, you can receive the, the, the passing electromagnetic wave and do something with it, and, and with its energy. Other questions? All right. Um, this, this wave that I've just, just uh, described for you is known as a vertically polarized electromagnetic wave. In, in reality, there are many different kinds of variations on, on these waves. They always involve magnetic fields and electric fields that are at right angles to each other and at right angles to the direction they travel. But you can play around with a lot of the details. And this wave is known as vertical because its electric field is vertical. The electric field is given precedence over the magnetic field because it's easier to, to, to sort of get the attention of the electric world because electric charges are so common. You can jiggle an electric charge around and, and launch, the, launch the wave. You can let the wave jiggle your electric charge around and receive the wave. 
It's harder to do that with magnets because magnets don't come in, in a pure north pole or pure south pole. So you can launch and receive the waves with magnets too, but not as easily. So anyway, for long ago, people decided to give the electric field the, the pride of place. And so this is called a vertically polarized wave. If I tipped the slide around, it wouldn't be vertical anymore, but you know, it would be some cockeyed angle, but it, it doesn't matter. People sort of can simply, you know, just, just think, for a simple wave traveling horizontally, it's ver vertical, it's, it's a possibility. The other possibility is just to take this wave and rotate it 90 degrees about that, that yellow traveling line, and then it becomes horizontally polarized. This wave has an electric field and a magnetic field just as before, but now the electric field is horizontal and the, ver and the magnetic field is vertical. It's just called a horizontally polarized wave. And in many cases, you, you know, you know, how would you notice the difference? Well, we'll see. There are various ways in which you, when you launch and when you detect the wave, it's different. And the, the, the waves experience different phenomena. Do they behave the same way? When they're just going through empty space, yeah, they don't notice it. You know, they're, they're indistinguishable, really. In fact, you know, if, you're, if you're in deep space, what does it mean to be vertical as opposed to horizontal? You know, there's no reference point. None of it matters. Where it will matter is, for example, if you're trying to launch one of these waves, if you want to launch a vertically polarized wave, you do it by taking the positive charge and going up and down vertically. Because that creates the vertical electric field fluctuation and the horizontal magnetic field fluctuation. If you try to receive that same wave, it, you're gonna receive it by watching a charge go up and down. If you wanna launch this one, this horizontal polarized wave, don't go up and down with your charge, go toward you and away from you. That will launch and, and correspondingly receive a horizontally polarized wave. And, and as an example of this you know, in real life, in the simplest of of uh, radio waves. The, the waves that are used to transmit what is commonly called AM radio. You've seen the antennas that transmit AM radio. They're very tall structures. Why are they tall? Because the, the wavelength of the wave that's used by, by sort of international convention to transmit uh, commercial AM, the wavelength is, is, is gigantic. It's, it's on the order of, of, of uh, 300 meters long, really long wavelength. So the, the distance between a, a vertical, an upward crest and another upward crest, you know, 1,000 feet, really long. It turns out to transmit that wave, you, you correspondingly need an antenna that's very long. It not, you don't want, actually need it to be 300 meters long. But the, but the most, fam, most common such trans, uh, um, antenna is one quarter of the wavelength long, and I'll talk about that later meaning it's about 75 meters long, um, you know, 200 feet. So the antenna's got to be quite tall, and some of them have to be taller than that. Given the, the choices of, well, you know, where are you going to put a, 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 a several hundred foot long antenna, you're not going to, like, run it through someone's neighborhood. You, you, you go straight up with it. So the antennas associated with AM radio are, are, are straight up and down. One antenna, straight up and down, and the charge is shuttled up and down that. And a consequence of that arrangement is the, that radio wave, that, the radio wave that these antennas launch is all vertically polarized wave. The electric field's going up and down, not, not toward you and away from you. And when you try to receive it, the res in principle, the, you, you'd want the same kind of antenna to receive it as, as to transmit it. But if your antenna is, is sensitive to an electric field that's going up and down, you'll receive it well. If you rotate your antenna the wrong way, so that it's not sensitive, so it's sensitive to, to toward you and away from you, uh, electric fields, you won't receive it. And so this is, you know, where does this show up? You, you guys are used to the cell phones, which are almost oblivious to which way you're holding them, because they work really hard to make it that way. But in the, in the days when you used to have antennas, obvious antennas associated with cell phones and stuff like that, you had to be careful how you oriented it, because you are trying to receive waves that have that have, the electric field's pointing somewhere. And if, you're po if, you, if, if the electric field is trying to push charge back and forth across your antenna, you don't get anything, because the charge can't move across it. This thing, which, I'm, which I don't use these days, you know that, that little antenna, 
charge going up and down that guy when it's working. And the, tr the, the transmission and receiving, if you hold the, the, the gadget that interacts with this so its antenna is exactly at right angles to that, they won't talk. Because this thing will be pushing charge up and down and up and down and launching waves with electric fields going up and down and up and down. And if you put your antenna at right angles to that, those, those electric fields up and down will try to push charge across your antenna, which does nothing. There's a wire, there's actually a wire inside this. No, no, no action, no joy. So um, I think you, you guys still find occasions when how you hold your cell phone matters, certainly where, you're, where you carry your cell phone matters. Um, but the engineers have done everything they can to make you as, as unsensitive to this effect as possible. All right? So that said, OK, so, so uh, AM radio goes out not, not with this kind of wave. Classic AM radio is all, is all this vertical polarized stuff. And that, that you do have to be careful about how you receive it. You know, this is a, this is a vertical. All right? Um, just to sort of complete the story, you know, what do waves look like when they have, you know, when they have different wavelengths? Here, the, these are three different waves with three different wavelengths. And it's sort of, it should be, you know, I, for complicated reasons, they're packed pretty tightly. I was trying to get them on the same screen. Um, you know, the wave at the top has the shortest wavelength. The wave in the middle has the longest wavelength, and the one on the bottom is somewhere in between. Okay. Uh, as a related item, if you, si if you just sit somewhere and watch the wave go by, so let's just sit right here. Here goes a, a down crest, up crest, down crest, up crest. The number of cycles that go by you every second. So here, here, here comes an up crest. I'll wait for next. Here comes another up crest. Down. Up. There, there, periodically, a, a crest goes by. And if you count how many go by per second, that's how many cycles how many of the wave go by each second, that's, that's a quantity known as frequency. And measure the, 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 the classic unit of, of frequency is cycles per second, also known as hertz. So if, if one million of those cycles go by per second, then the, then the radio wave has a frequency of one million cycles per second, or one million hertz. And the classic AM radio stations that, that you might or might not, not listen to anymore are in that range. Um, one that I know in town, WINA, is 1070. It's, it's one million seventy thousand cycles per second. So if you just sit still and watch the crest go by and count them for a second, you'll see one million and seventy uh, seventy thousand go by. It's, it's okay. Uh, the FM radio stations are, have been have been assigned uh, a much higher frequency. They go by about a hundred million cycles go by per second, so much faster. As the frequency goes up, so this is this is the this is the the fastest cycling here occurs for this top wave, which also has the shortest wavelength. They're, the crests are closer together, they're all moving at the same speed, so if the crests are closer together, more of them pass you every second. This long wave in the middle, it's got a long wavelength, the crests go by much more, much more, much less often. The frequency is much lower. So it's got a long wavelength, and the number of cycles per second that go by are small. They go, to get, so they go together. The shorter the wavelength, the, the higher the frequency. And actually, if you multiply the frequency times the wavelength, you get the speed of light. And it's not a coincidence. OK? You all right with the idea, the, the general structure of an electromagnetic wave? The idea behind it is this, this perpetual recreation of, of the two fields recreating each other. OK. So um, I know this, this question, I've already sort of walked all over it. If you place a positive test charge in, in the, the way that I had going by m moments ago, uh, will the test charge experience a force? What do you think? Yes? No. No voters. <laughs> it's Friday after all, right? Yeah, the weekend. It's, of course, it, it, it gets jiggled up and down. As that wave goes by, whenever, whenever that 
if it's a vertically polarized wave, whenever the, whenever the up electric field is, is, hits this spot, it, it wants to accelerate upward. Whenever the down, uh, a strong downward uh, electric field hits here, it gets pushed up. So it gets, it gets shoved up and down, it responds. And as we'll see when I talk about sunlight um, later on, that, that motion, uh, uh, when an electromagnetic wave goes through material and jiggles the charges, it, it, it has important effects on, on both on the passage of the light and on the material. So we'll, we'll play with that comes, come the story of sunlight. But certainly, if you have one of these charges sitting in a piece of metal and the, elect and the electromagnetic wave goes by, it's going to jiggle the charge up and down in the metal. And jiggling charge on a wire is a current. You can measure that. And so this is, in effect, how they detect a radio wave going by. You watch the charge being jiggled. Uh, it's sort of a very symmetric concept that if you deliberately jiggle charge up and down on a wire, you will launch a radio wave. And if you let the radio wave go by a wire, the radio wave will jiggle charge up and down on the wire, and you can, you can detect the radio wave. And that's basically how radio transmission and reception work. Uh, I talked a little bit about already about this idea that, that accelerating charge launches the waves, um, and that the, the waves themselves can cause charge to accelerate. Again, the, the very symmetric thing that's happening. Um, to show you this, ha you know, what I'll do next is, is show you the, the process of launching a wave. And to launch a wave efficiently, it's nice to move more than one charge. And to move more than one charge rhythmically back and forth, it's nice to use a device that is resonant at the frequency you have in mind. And what's resonant mean? A, a, a resonant system, and I should, should have dragged out the bowling ball pendulum here, um, which I've played with before. You, you've watched that pendulum go back and forth. It has a favorite frequency. Back in a second. here. I'm coming back. All right. So, boiling water. The world is filled with things that have natural rhythms to them. It's something that I go in, into at length in the, in the fall course, but, but just for the moment. This pendulum, ah, this pendulum almost fell on the floor. Come on, go in there. All right. OK. So this is a system that has a natural rhythm to it. If I take it away, it's, first of all, it's got an equilibrium, which, which means a point at which it's, it's experiencing zero net force. And if you put it there motionless, it stays there. Remember, that's that, that whole story. If you take it away from this equilibrium, it loves to return toward that equilibrium. So it's a type of equilibrium known as a stable equilibrium, one to which uh, when you disturb it, it goes back naturally. Uh, the alternative to a stable equilibrium is an unstable equilibrium. This thing's in equilibrium right now, but if it, if it leaves the equilibrium, it goes away and never comes back. Anyway, stable equilibrium, and another feature about it, I mean, it has to do with it, it, it's its rhythm is independent of how big the motion is. That's the sto story of the harmonic oscillator, which is part of, again, the fall course. If I take this away from equilibrium and let go, it swings back and forth about equilibrium. In this case, mechanically, it's a mechanical oscillator, a rhythmic thing. And its rhythm is rock steady. And in this case, it's a special kind of oscillator known as a harmonic one, in which not only is it rock steady, but it is independent of whether it's a little swing or a big swing. OK? Same rhythm. Last time I timed this, it was like four and a half seconds. It's been a while, but that's the idea. OK? So this is a, a, a system that goes through a rhythmic motion with a rhythm that doesn't matter. You know, whether it's a little motion or big, big motion, little motion, same rhythm. That's all mechanical. It turns out you can make exactly the same concept happen electrically. You can make an electric harmonic oscillator. And an electric harmonic oscillator, 
looks like the gadget on the right. There are five images of the same gadget, and I'll show you it as an animation shortly. But, I, but I'll, I'll start with it motionless here. It consists of only two electric components that I've already talked about last time or the time before. On the right side is a component known as a capacitor. We've seen the capacitors from time to time. I charged one up early in the semester and made a big spark with it. it it's a device that stores separated electric charge. Two surfaces, you put positive charge on one, negative charge on the other, and there's lots of energy stored in the, in the uh, uh, electric field. Uh, the electric forces between the charges are, or equivalently, in the electric field between the charges. They're storing lots of energy, okay? The more charge you have on the, uh, in, in, the more separated charge you have, the more energy is packed into that capacitor. The other component in this device is just a coil of wire, which is an electromagnet. More, uh, it, it, as an electric component, it's known as an inductor. And it's a device that stores energy in a magnetic field. And it uses that energy stored in the magnetic field to try to keep current in the coil from changing. It fights changes in current. Remember the big electromagnet? When I turn it on, it the current increases slowly as the magnetic field builds off. When I turn it off, the current decreases slowly as the magnetic field builds down. And that caused a big spark to occur in, the, in a switch. It's very hard to stop the current flow, because once you get it started, it likes to continue, and it doesn't want to stop. OK, so these two components, an, an inductor that stores magnetic energy and a capacitor that stores electric energy, you connect them together, and the energy shuttles back and forth between electric field on the right and magnetic field on the left. It goes back and forth and back and forth rhythmically with a rhythm that's independent of how much jiggling is going on, the, the quantity of charge that's shuttling back and forth. And so now let me show you this as, a, as an animation. This, yeah, I, this is the old way I would do it as a, um, as a series of pictures, but I can show you an animation instead. And let me start with it. Just let, I'll just let her rip. So here on the left is the capacitor, and here on the right is the inductor. And the, the, the general thing to observe is there's a moment at which the charge stored charge reaches its maximum, and with it, the, elect the, magnetic the electric field, you know, we're at minimum now, maximum, minimum electric field power uh, energy, maximum electric field energy, and minimum, maximum. And as it goes through these minimums and maximums, the charge on the capacitor reverses. Now it's, it's a negative charge on the top plate. In a moment, it's going to be positive charge on the top plate. And then, negative charge, and then positive charge. The charge, the capacitor is trying to get rid of its, of its energy, trying to get rid of its, electric, uh, of its stored separated charge. It does that by sending the charges out into the wide world, you know, <laughs> go west. Um, the charge tries to go off into the inductor, and the inductor takes that charge, and as the charge begins to flow through the inductor, the inductor develops a magnetic field. So as you'll notice that each time charge really begins to flow from the capacitor over into the inductor, and the current really builds up in the inductor, the magnetic field reaches a maximum. So whenever the electric field here is at a maximum, the magnetic field's a minimum. Whenever the electric field's a minimum, the magnetic field's maximum. The energy really is shuttling back and forth. And you might think, well, so why does the capacitor, which is now fully charged, now it's got no charge, why does it recharge? It recharges because as the capacitor was initially discharging, it was storing energy in the inductor. Well, the inductor doesn't like sudden changes in current. And so when the, when the capacitor runs out of stored energy and tries to stop the current flow, the inductor says, no, I don't like changes in, in current. I'll keep the current going. And the current continues long enough to recharge the capacitor upside down. So, each, so basically, the capacitor is trying to get rid of all, its, of all of its energy. Positive negative charge. It takes, you know, send all of its energy into the inductor. The, 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 these opposite charges try to get together. And they do, and they build a magnetic field. And the magnetic field tries to, once they're all together, you'd think everything would stop. But no, the inductor keeps them going. And they end up accumulating back on the capacitor upside down. And then they go back together, and they accumulate on the capacitor upside down together and back. Is that okay? 
hand wavy said you can stare at the uh, at the video figures on the in the ebook and watch this happen with me jibber jabbering about it but that's the basic idea this is known as a tank circuit because it, it it's an electrical version of like of like an aquarium tank if you get a you know a tank of water you can get the water sloshing same idea with a bathtub you know right don't slosh you get water on the floor okay as with a tank of water or this bowling ball, you can get the sloshing activity going in two very different ways. I could get this thing swinging back and forth, either by giving it one mighty push, okay, and off it goes, or by giving it gentle pushes in rhythm with its own natural motion. So you always do work on it, always push it as it goes away from you. Now, now, right? And you build up energy in this sloshing motion. The same thing happens in these tank circuits. You can get the, the charge sloshing back and forth, either with one mighty push. You just, a big spark hits the top, dumps a whole lot of positive charge on the top plate. Bang, you're in business. Or you can give gentle, rhythmic pushes and get more and more charge going. And that ability to gradually get the charge moving is why tank circuits are all over the place in radio. Because you usually don't need to get it going in one instant. You're, you're, the cycles occur very fast, millions, billions of times a second. You don't have to do it all in one push. You can use a thousand cycles. You push it once each cycle. And you can get more and more charge moving and more and more energy in that tank circuit. And you can ultimately get lots of energy. And, and so uh, radio transmission transmitters, for example, use tank circuits so that they can get more and more charge sloshing on their antenna, run up the antenna and down, up the antenna and down, and just push. Uh, you need huge amounts of charge to go up, up and down the antenna to, to really produce a strong radio wave. And the tank circuits really help that happen. Is this OK? Followable? Um, before I let the whole day go by and make, make uh, Al set these radio, radio systems up again. Let me turn off this guy. Yeah, you want to get that off? Yeah, OK. Um, this has a tank circuit in it. Th this is a gadget. This is a radio transmitter right here. This is a tank circuit with, an, with, a, with, with a power source in, in and of itself, let me turn it on, it takes a little while to warm up. It's going to get charge sloshing back and forth through that loop of wire. That first one way, then the other. And how fast VHF? It's probably 100 million times a second, give or take. In fact, I, I could figure it out if I, the, from, the wave, from the lengths of stuff here. So the charge is going back and forth and back and forth, and it, and it builds that charge up gradually. As the charge goes back and forth in that loop of wire, it develops a magnetic field that, for, turn, that goes first ar around this horizontal part of the loop one way, and then goes around the other way, back and forth. And this, just, this is just a piece of wire, vertical piece of wire. That magnetic field that's, that's reversing back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, is affecting that wire. It's a changing magnetic field in that wire, which is causing charge to be pushed, an electric field up and down, up and down. So this is, this is now has charge going up and down it. You can't see the charge, but it's there. And I can, sh ah, I can show you a picture of what, what the charge looks like as it's doing this. And you'll notice over here there's a light bulb. There's no power source for that light bulb. That light bulb is glowing because this thing is transmitting a pretty strong electromagnetic wave, you know, enough that I don't want to stand here all day. It's, as the charge goes up and down on this, and the magnetic field goes around and back and forth. It's, it's sending out a wave, and the light bulbs, you, you can see it lit. Is that, is that visible from, OK. You know, it's still out here. It's getting dimmer. The field gets weak. The, the electromagnetic wave gets weaker for many reasons. But part of it is just, just the, as, a, as a wave spreads out in uh, two, two dimensions, it loses its intensity. But it's, you know, it's still, you notice it here as a glowing light bulb filament. Uh, as, I, as we talked about, 
the, this wave has an electric field that's, that's pointing up and down and up and down, and a magnetic field that's going horizontally back and forth. To receive it, we want a vertical antenna. If I rotate the antenna 90 degrees, the light bulb goes out. You see the light bulb's out? This is the wrong direction. The, electric, the vertical electric field is trying to push charge across the antenna. That's no good. You need a vertical an antenna. Is it OK? Um, to show you, I'll turn this back off and stop cooking myself. Um, what I wanted to show you is it, uh, that, that kind of antenna is known as a, this guy here is known as a half-wave antenna. It's, it is itself a resonant device. It's essentially a tank circuit. It's the same as the, the tank circuit had a capacitor and an inductor. What if you grab the capacitor, you grab the two plates of the capacitor and that coil of inductor, and you just pull them straight. <laughs> the coil just straight, it's a straight stick. You shrink the plates until they're just, just stick thin. It's still got a capacitor, the top and bottom, and it's still got an inductor, the, the shaft between the top and bottom. So this piece of copper you're seeing on the, on the animation, it's still a tank circuit. The top and bottom are the capacitor, and they store a separated charge. The top, will, in a moment, will have lots of positive, there's lots of negative on the bottom. That's the capacitor charged. The middle is the inductor. It's got a current flowing through it, and whenever the current's strong, the magnetic field is strong. So Oddly enough, it's, it's still an inductor. And it's still resonant at a special frequency. And the frequency is related, and I'll, I'm, not, I'm clearly not going to get to it. The frequency of, of, it, of this sloshing motion is related to the length of the antenna. And this one is chosen to work very nicely at this particular radio wave frequency. So that's what's known as a half wave antenna. It's physically half the wavelength long of the wave it transmits. And you can see whenever the, there's lots of positive charge at the top, there's a strong downward uh, electric field, like right now. Lots of positive charge on top. The electric field points down towards the negative charge. And whenever the current is reaching a peak, like right now, there's a womp and magnetic field looping around the antenna. And those two, a vertical electric field that's fluctuating and a horizontal magnetic field that's fluctuating, they form a team. Not all of them get together, but, part, but parts of those electric and magnetic fields form a team, and they become a wave that heads off across space. All right? So what we'll do, what, what remains to be done is to look at how you can, tr you can use this kind of a transmitted wave to send sound information or, or, or computer information. And we'll do that on Monday. <laughs>